Suppose you are an electrical contractor that is used to working on general commercial buildings doing repairs and upgrades. You use the same tools and test equipment every day and you are very comfortable doing what you do. It's just another day on the job when you show up at a large multi-story commercial building and you have to go to an office on the third floor where some receptacles aren't working. You arrive and contact someone at the front desk and they tell you what floor and what hallway to take to go to the office, but nothing more. You weren't given much information from your coordinator before heading to the job, so you really don't know who to ask to talk to for more details. You get to the office and the individual inside points to the couple of outlets that don't work. No big deal, nothing out of the ordinary. You test for voltage and nothing. You ask the individual whose office it is where the panel is that feeds these outlets since they are not labeled in any way and they have no clue. Just so happens that while you are there starting to think of who to talk to or where to look next, Smoke starts coming from one of the electrical closets on this floor, and it may be related to the outlets you are there to fix. Sure enough, more smoke, and now the fire alarm goes off, and people start to panic and move quickly to the exits. What do you do next? Now imagine you are in the same situation, but in a hospital, where you need to think of the NFPA phrase, defend in place. To defend in place means the operational response to an emergency in a building in which the initial action does not involve evacuation of the building occupants. How would you handle this situation? As a contractor that needs to perform work in a hospital, preparation and planning is not only the first step, but can be considered the most critical step. It is hard to make a list of everything that needs to be done since every hospital is different and it is impossible to predict what might happen while on the job site but there are a lot of things that you can plan for before you begin working at the hospital. You've got transfers, uh, you've got generators. Uh, basically, you have to do your homework and this is where the time comes into it. You've got to look at single line drawings, you've got to verify with the hospital any changes that have, have taken place, and you may have to go even as far back as to get, if there's any renovations or anything done on that power system in the last year, to make sure that you get those as-built drawings. Uh, is a contractor, an outside contractor, just because we're working on this phase of a power distribution, we have not, may not have the, the phase previous to that. So what you do, again, it comes down to the communication part of it. You try to get as much information on what you're working on uh, to be able to perform your work. The advice that I would give somebody that is working in a hospital, you can really never get comfortable. There are just too many things in a hospital that can go wrong. You have to cross your T's and dot your I's. And the worst thing that you can do when you're working in a hospital is being in a hurry. The, the faster you go, the worse it gets. You just gotta take your time, plan your work, and make sure you know what those outcomes are gonna be. If you're working in a hospital, you always have to remember your responsibility is not just purely to yourself and your own crew that you are working around. Everybody from the nursing staff all the way down to the patients could be affected by any decision that you make. You always have to remember that these patients have no other safety measure other than you thinking ahead and planning so that they are not negatively impacted. Some of the main things to consider during the preparation and planning stage include, is it new or old construction? How large or small is the task or job? Who from your company will be working with you? Who from other companies will be working with your team? Is there a clear chain of command on your team and who will make decisions on site? Will you be working with hospital maintenance personnel? Is there any switching that will need to be done and who will perform this task, including the hospital or utility personnel? Where on the electrical system does the utility ownership end and the hospital begin? Will you be working on the essential electrical system? If so, what branch will you be working on? And will you be working on any life safety systems such as the fire alarm, security, communication, gas, or HVAC? These are just a small sample of questions that you as a contractor will need to think about from the beginning. Once there is a good general understanding of the job at hand, the details need to be collected, sorted, and documented. There should be a list of contacts for every person involved, including a network of experts to reference for technical questions. Plans in a hospital, you know, depending on if it's uh, utility related, service related, we usually go by, we have a MOP, a method of procedure. So what we'll do is we'll go through that method of procedure of what we're gonna do step by step. 
from day and time, what steps it's going to take, who's going to be involved in the process, uh, emergency contact information, uh, so on and so forth, all that down the line. So that anybody that is going to be involved in the procedure or process that we're doing is involved in that MOP. The nurses are involved in all the job meetings. So the head nurse from the, 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 the hospital uh, during our job meetings, either weekly or bi-weekly, are involved in everything that is going on. They take an active part in the construction process. It's going to be their unit. It's going to be, they're going to be the ones working there, whether it becomes equipment layout, uh, where the nurse's station is, what is equipped in the nurse's station, that is all part of the decision that they need to be involved in. They're a part of the essential team for the wing, ward, wherever you're working. They, they are part of that. So they, they need to be involved in the conversation of, of what is being done and how it's being done. Working in a hospital, especially as a supervisor, you have to take that leadership role. You are the person that is the point person for the crew and the people working under you. It's a big responsibility to take on. So if you're gonna take on that responsibility, you've gotta take it very seriously. And it's not only an eight hour process. If there's something that you don't know or, or information that you need, you have to be willing to reach out and ask the right questions to the right people to get it answered. Another piece of advice that I would give anybody working in the hospital is to get to build a relationship with the maintenance people, the, the directors, as much information and team building that you can build with them it'll always be a resource for you down the line. It's always somebody that you can pick up the phone and call and say, hey, I'm at such and such a place. I'm into this, I've never seen it before. What is your opinion? Those team building things, those resources are invaluable. All of the right personnel need to be aware of the work that is going to be done as well as anyone else within the hospital that may be affected. Generally, everything will be documented to verify the right contacts and information is reviewed and passed along. You never want to rely on the word of mouth that something is done or will get done. We're responsible for our own safety. So if I'm working on something, me as an individual, as an electrician that worked in the field for 39 years, I understand lock -on tech. I am responsible for my own safety and before I work on anything energized, I verify for myself that it is off. Some examples of contacts will be construction or project managers, maintenance or facility personnel, utility companies, medical personnel, nurses, and many more. It's always important that the nurses understand what is going on in their specific area of that hospital because they have their own responsibilities to patients. If they do not know what is going on, then in any type of an emergency, they could take the wrong step, which could cost valuable seconds that lead to a negative possibility for a patient. Uh, this could come from them not knowing that an icker barrier is up that is blocking off a hallway, so then they have to take a different route around to a patient. That could cause, and that could cost valuable seconds if they're trying to go to a code. Uh, in a other situation, if they, if they are trying to plug in uh, a monitor and they're searching around for a uh, a receptacle that doesn't have power, because you seen and because you're working on that system, if they were not aware of that, they could be searching around for a couple of minutes trying to figure out what receptacle they need to be plugging into. Again, these things can all cost valuable seconds that could be very important. Something to consider when working with project managers is that they tend to change roles a lot and you may end up working with several different ones, so be aware that some may be better than others. Similarly, not all building managers are on the same level since we are at a time where many of them are retiring or transitioning to a new job and the next person in that role may not know the buildings as well as you think they should. The problem that I see with uh, the people retirement and retiring and not being replaced is going to be a big, big problem. That those resources of somebody being in a hospital for 30 odd years and knowing that hospital, knowing the systems 
in that hospital. That was a resource from a contractor that we used, that we relied on. Uh, we kind of depended upon them uh, to give us the layout or a general overview of what we're doing. And then our knowledge of what we were doing, we kind of picked it up from there. But to lose that resource and not to have that somebody in waiting to fill that role it will be a big problem. Line lines are rarely accurate depending on how old they are. That can usually give you a good idea of how accurate they're going to be. Uh, but you absolutely want to talk to the hospital maintenance electricians if they have some on site. Uh, they will be able to give you the best knowledge of how often things change that may not be documented. Listen to the people who have already been there. Absorb as much information as you possibly can because they have been there for a while. They understand what all these systems are. There are so many moving parts in a hospital. It could take an entire career to understand them all. Uh, from maintenance personnel through construction personnel, it's very important for you to always just come every day trying to learn more because if you stop learning any more about that situation, you are not going to be able to continue to proceed through your job. Be cautious of the information you receive because it may not be complete. To build the right team for your project, you may need to include a construction or project manager, maintenance personnel, the utility company, medical administration, and nurses. Also, make sure the project manager has a list of any other contacts that are needed. Collecting current drawings, schematics, electrical system studies, and other relevant documentation is extremely beneficial. Some examples of these may include one-line or three-line drawings, short circuit and coordination studies, a certified arc flash study, arc flash labels, maintenance log or labels on equipment, fire alarm prints, and building automation details. Picture yourself working, or, you know, you're the contractor for a hospital, some healthcare facility, and there's a problem going on and they need it addressed and you, uh, you show up on site or you're on site already and you need to address the issue. The one line diagram is critical because A, you're going to f try to find, if you know an area of the, of the facility where there's a problem, you need to find out what power, what feeders, what circuit breakers, what panel boards are feeding that area of the, of the structure. And if you don't have an accurate one line diagram, you're not gonna be able to isolate that information. So the one line diagram is, is, is critical in the planning phase and in the response phase to any type of issues in a, in a facility. In addition to the drawings and studies, you should try to establish the layout of the hospital buildings, including names of different buildings for hospital campuses, where the substations are located, where electrical rooms are located, and where generators and transfer switches are located. In addition to the site information, you should be aware of special tools and equipment that may be needed at the hospital, including special test equipment like GFCI cords, containment materials, structures, or PPE, a special HEPA vacuum, or remote racking devices. Many of the safety requirements inside a hospital are more extravagant than most commercial buildings. Uh, any time that you are plugging into any circuit in the hospital, it needs to be a ground fault protected circuit for construction. Uh, whether that means you are just finding a local uh, GFCI plug, or whether it means that you are bringing, you're carrying around your own uh, personal GFCI to plug in line with a uh, house uh, receptacle. Uh, GFCIs are very important to make sure that if there's a fault in uh, one of your tools or whatever you are using, uh, even as simple as a cord, that you are not accidentally going to shut off power to a receptacle circuit that could be feeding multiple rooms and the panels could be in multiple locations where you may not always have access to those areas. Uh, if, if a uh, panel is located uh, in an area where infection control is at a critical means, it may take quite a while for you to be able to get access to resetting that breaker. Once you have all the contacts you think you will need, 
Do you have a priority of who to contact for different situations that may arise? Who is responsible for emergency situations? And how does that factor into your plans and procedures? Uh, the biggest thing that's working in a hospital is the communication part of it, is to whatever you're tasked to do, that you talk to the building maintenance people, you get an overall idea of what is going to be effective by, affected by what you're looking at. And you kind of work on a game plan, okay, this went down or this trip, and you, you kind of come up with a procedure uh, to correct it. You always need to make sure that everybody on the crew understands where they are working and the importance of the job that they're doing and that there are lives on the line for any possible mistake that could possibly be made. So that extra layer of care needs to always be taken. Well, when you're building a team, the most important part of building a team is making sure that you have the right people for the job. Uh, once that is in place, um, the next big thing is to make sure everybody's on the same page as far as safety is concerned and procedures are concerned. Um, so if there is an incident, you know, everybody knows how to react properly or you know, correspond properly. For our manpower on the job and a typical hospital job, we are going to have a project manager in the office that will support the office side of the construction, which is the coordination with the design team, the coordination with general contractors, the, the change orders, the RFIs. So our, our starts with our project manager in the office, and then we have a superintendent. We have a field superintendent that oversees everybody. That field superintendent will identify the foreman he wants on that job. Depending on the size of the job, there might be a sub foreman under that foreman, but the foreman's the lead. And then, then the foreman, and then the journeyman, and then the apprentices. And typically there's one apprentice to every three to four journeymen on a project, I believe, is the ratio. Some special consideration should be given to things like infection control and working around patient areas in the hospital. Air handling and fire barriers are a critical part of the defend in place considerations. ICRA, or the uh, hospital infection control uh, regulations, is the, is the way that they figured out is the best way to try to keep the patient safe from any germs that could be coming from, uh, from construction itself. Whether it is trying to keep the patient safe from the construction workers, or whether it's uh, trying to keep the patient safe from any elements that could be uh, introduced into their system by opening up a ceiling that hasn't been opened in 10 years. Uh, you could have anything from uh, a mold spore uh, to just, ger and just germ particles that have just been up there and have not been exposed to the uh, regular HVAC system in 10 years. Uh, so it's always very important to, on a daily basis, make sure that you are following all of those ICR practices. Whether you fully understand them or not, there are reasons why they are all in place. ICRA includes uh, any level of ICRA from uh, using a, a single pop-up tent if you are just going to be working in a small isolated area just to pop a ceiling tile or two uh, to access the ceiling, all the way to soft wall barriers if this is only going to be a one, something for a day or two days uh, in a room or maybe a hallway that you're uh, sectioning off to maybe you're going to be in an area for six months and at that point you put up an ICRA, an ICRA hard wall barrier. Uh, all of these systems are used constantly in hospitals uh, and the proper, uh, the proper barrier will be discussed before the project with that hospital's uh, control person for their ICRA system. Well, I've been in hospitals for the last 39 years. So <clears throat> I, I've done quite a bit of work in, in hospitals. Probably the biggest change is ICRA. What you can do in hospitals, set, taking ceiling towel on, how you work in a hospital was probably the biggest change. I'd probably say in the last 10 years, 10, 12 years, that, uh, that they become more aware of it and 
put more regulations in for how you work in a hospital. You have to have the portable cart with the air pressure, uh, negative air, uh, to capture that. So none of that gets in to, to the air. Uh, typically, when we do bigger hospital jobs, you'll have a GC that'll come in and put ICR containment up for that area. So they'll put the walls in, put the negative pressure, uh, and do all that so that you can work like you would normally inside that containment. It does add uh, time to your task when you, you come with ICRA, especially if you don't have an ICRA containment uh, within the area you're working. If you've got to do it off of portable carts, it's a, it, it's a big time factor. Executing a project in a hospital based on your preparation and procedures requires you to follow the original plan. If adjustments must be made, you and the team need to have agreed upon procedures to allow changes to the documented plans. This will allow you to complete the work safely and within expectations avoiding unexpected disruption to the essential electrical system. One of the biggest lessons I've learned in spending quite a few years in hospitals is the importance of constant communication and constant planning of every detail of your job, no matter how small it may seem, there could be something else down the line that you are not personally aware of because the hospital wouldn't normally find it a reason to make you aware of it that could be affected by your job. So it is always important to have open conversation between every layer of the construction team uh, to make sure that no patient's well-being is uh, negatively affected. Traditionally, when you went to a hospital to execute a specific task or larger project, you got clear and precise direction from someone like a facility manager that worked at that hospital for 40 plus years. For several years now, that is becoming less and less the case. As the people in these types of roles retire, the positions aren't always backfilled by someone with similar knowledge and expertise. There may come a time when all the preparation and planning has been done thoroughly and all approvals are in place, but when it comes time to execute the job, the whole plan may change, get delayed, or even canceled. Things can happen that nobody has control over when it comes to performing work in different spaces of a hospital. Many times, maintenance and upgrades will be performed overnight when the work can be completed with a lower risk of disruption to things like surgeries, testing, and treatment. I heard a story about someone that while driving to the hospital around midnight to perform maintenance on the electrical system, got a call that they had to delay their work. What happened was a bad accident occurred involving several cars and the people were on their way to the ER and they couldn't take any chances of something happening and losing power while they were caring for those patients. After execution of a project at a hospital, you should think about the lessons learned so that you can be ready for the next project. This includes thinking about how you are going to leave the site for the next contractor, which could be you, to work on the same equipment or area. In every job that I do, I take a lot of pride in my work. Uh, not only is that just a personal pride to know that you did your job, you did it well, and if somebody else comes in and looks at it, they'll be able to tell that just by looking at your work. But there's also additional points to it, especially in a hospital situation where who's going to be the next person that comes to work on that system? No hospital system is ever fully complete. I take pride in my work because if I come back, I want it to be done right. And if somebody else comes back, I want it to be easier for them instead of having to work twice as hard to get the job done. Remember, hospitals are a business and as such, operate within a defined budget and therefore they pay close attention to how their projects are executed. Your work at the hospital from the initiation of the project to the completion, including the cleanup, will be carefully scrutinized. Your performance may dictate who they will choose to do their next project. I tell all my apprentices is you got to take pride in your work. You have to do the job the best that you can to have the best outcome for not only you, but for your company and the customer, because if the job's done and you did a lousy job, there's a chance the customer's not going to call you back. So if you take your time, take that extra minute to make it look a little bit better than what somebody else might, then that customer is going to call you back. And that's important because you have to have repeat business or you don't have a business. Um, so taking that extra minute, making it look a little bit nicer, cleaning up after you're done, 
all these things are very important in no matter what aspect of a job that you do for the return call. Beyond projects, regular testing, inspection and maintenance of high value electrical equipment is critical. You may be called upon to support this testing and maintenance, so if you see potential issues while you're working on a project at a hospital, it is important that you point them out to the team involved in your project. If, a, if an unsafe condition is identified, it could be electrically, it could be, it could be any other trade. All, all the GCs that we work for tell us, and it's, it's in our safety procedure, that it's a, it's a stop work, it's a notifi notify. No matter, no matter what the issue is, if you see anything that's unsafe, whether it's your trade or another trade, y you need to let somebody know. And that somebody would be the safety officer for the general contractor. Typically the GC, the general contractor has a safety officer on every project. And th those safe conditions would be reported to that said person. As the demands on healthcare facilities continue to change due to advancements in treatment technology, power systems will also need to be updated. Many hospitals operate with power equipment that is decades past its useful life. In those cases, enhanced inspection and maintenance are critical to continued dependable operation. Retro commissioning can play a large role in this process. This systematic process involves identifying less than optimal performance in your facility's equipment and systems and makes the necessary adjustments. While retrofitting involves replacing outdated equipment, retro commissioning focuses on improving the efficiency of what's already in place. Essential electrical power systems must meet the minimum inspection, testing, and maintenance requirements in NFPA 110. Additionally, when testing for NFPA and the Joint Commission standards, it is important to arrange the time needed for shutdowns to perform necessary preventative maintenance as well as equipment and controls modernization. Installing anything that had to do with distributions to patient rooms is another. We'd have to communicate with the hospital, find out exactly which service is going to it, which service could be interrupted, and fill out some kind of method of procedure on how we were going to accomplish setting the transformer, setting the panel, uh, putting a breaker in for the panel, and tying the panel in. So we would deal with the maintenance electricians, the maintenance foreman, uh, to review all those steps come up and we would actually work it backwards all the way to the point where our final thing would be the tie-in and that's something that we'd coordinate with the hospital. If I was given a job of installing a new transformer out of a 480 volt panel to feed a new 120 volt panel for a patient room, I would be looking into what is feeding that 480 volt transformer. Uh, is it emergency power? Is it normal power? Uh, being that it's going into a patient room does not necessarily tell you what type of power it's going to have. Many patient rooms will have three sources of power uh, with uh, normal power, critical care, and life safety all in that room. First thing I'd want to do is get a hold of the hospital let them know, hey, what our plan of action is, what we're doing. Number two, I would determine if I needed ICRA. You know, if, if I needed an ICRA containment set up or something that I could do through, uh, you know, portable tents. So that would basically be the process. We, you know, we'd communicate with the nurses station or admin, whoever we were working for, get the okay, tell them what we were going to do, our time frame in doing it in the area that we were going to work in. For preventative maintenance in a hospital, uh, whether this is testing, oil sampling, anything like that, uh, primarily uh, looking into switch gear. Uh, most of this work will primarily be done by hospital maintenance personnel, but occasionally uh, we are required to come in and assist them with this work. Uh, we will generally follow their lead they will come up with the plan of what needs to uh, be taken care of during this maintenance cycle. They will inform us of what we need. And, if, and I will go over their plan in very, very detailed and make sure that if there are any questions I have, that those are answered before we begin the maintenance cycle. If it has to do with uh, anything with 
building, uh, distribution, uh, anything with maintenance, uh, we kind of approach it as a team aspect or a team concept. Whoever's coming in to do the testing, do the uh, oil testing, uh, anything to do with cleaning equipment, preventive maintenance, we work through that testing company with, along with the hospital and ourselves, we'll develop an MOP and proceed in that fashion. Annual infrared thermographic scanning of electrical power equipment is also a recommended best practice. It helps organizations to discover potential problem areas and correct them before they develop into dangerous and disruptive failures. It can also be used as a predictive maintenance tool. To provide additional assistance for facility managers in compliance with the testing mandates of NFPA, healthcare market-specific generator controls are available with features that automate this testing and reporting. They also incorporate those times when the generators are run in the absence of available utility power that can be applied to meet the testing requirements. If you want to learn more about planning electrical work and building a team to complete projects in healthcare facilities, contact us or your local Eaton representative to schedule a visit to the Power Systems Experience Center today.